somebody made a hundred million dollars and now don't have to talk to that artist or none of their crew don't have to validate none of their contracts, now only got to deal with the mama. It is widely recognized that black comedians have historically not received the recognition they deserve compared to their white counterparts. This sentiment has been echoed by several comedians, including Red Fox. Presently, Cat Williams has emerged as a prominent figure in the comedy scene, championing the cause that Red Fox advocated for. Red Fox, the iconic American comedian and actor, left an enduring legacy in the realm of entertainment through his memorable role in the legendary television series Sanford and Son and his groundbreaking comedy albums. Yet, beneath the glitz of his success lurked a somber reality that eventually engulfed him, financial devastation. I hear some of my own material on television and they won't let me do it, but still another guy can go on the show and do it. And then they get the young black comics and they twist their minds, you know, and they talk about watermelon and... During the 1970s, Fox soared to the pinnacle of comedy stardom. Widely recognized for his talent, he commanded some of the highest paychecks among comedians of that era. Adding to his triumphs, his portrayal of Fred Sanford and Sanford and Son propelled him to unprecedented heights, making him the highest paid actor on TV for several consecutive years. Nevertheless, fame often accompanies a deceptive sense of invincibility, and a penchant for discretionary spending that can spiral out of control. Red Fox, unfortunately, fell prey to this phenomenon, succumbing to a lifestyle of extravagance. Complicated by expensive divorce proceedings and a tendency to procrastinate on taxes, he found himself submerged in debt when tragedy struck. Just young stepping fetches and and Mantan Morland's repeat. I won't go that direction. I turned down two major roles in a Broadway show. At the time of his passing, Red Fox faced a staggering $3.5 million in unpaid taxes. Consequently, this overwhelming financial burden wiped out his net worth entirely, leaving the once prosperous star with a crushing $3.5 million on his balance sheet. The narrative of Fox's downfall is both cautionary and tragic, serving as a stark reminder that fiscal responsibility is paramount regardless of one's level of success or earning potential. Despite earning astronomical sums during his prime years, imprudent financial choices led to his ultimate financial ruin. This year, one role in a movie that would have made a difference to me, but I just couldn't except the part that they offered me. It was really going back to before Civil War days, you know. Though Red Fox departed this world amidst financial challenges, let us not overlook the profound impact he had on comedy through his revolutionary contributions. His unfiltered humor reshaped stand-up comedy, leaving an indelible mark and in opening doors for generations of comedians. Red Fox's portrayal of Fred G. Sanford in the immensely popular television show Sanford and Son played a pivotal role in his financial prosperity during the 1970s. The show the show consistently secured a place among the top 10 programs throughout its five-year run, granting Fox the leverage to negotiate higher salaries for his role, ultimately earning him around $35,000 per episode. And shuffle, and I talk bad enough already, I don't need to put it on film, you know. Not as for money, you know. Fox's stellar performance on Sanford and Son earned him six Emmy Award nominations, underscoring the significant impact his character had on both audiences and critics. While he didn't secure any Emmy wins, these nominations solidified his status as one of the most recognizable figures on television during that era. Despite the financial success enjoyed during this period, it's crucial to recognize that Fox encountered substantial financial challenges later in life, ultimately filing for bankruptcy protection in 1983 due to accrued debt. Certainly, there is no denying the profound impact Sanford and Son had on Red Fox's financial success in the 1970s. The show not only allowed him to amass a significant fortune, but also solidified his position as one of the highest-earning television stars of that era. Through his portrayal of Fred G. Sanford, Fox showcased his comedic brilliance, winning the hearts of audiences globally. Give me my money. No. I said no. No, I want my money. I said, I said no. Pop, now get out of here. <laughs> In conclusion, Red Fox's role in Sanford and Son played a pivotal role in shaping his high net worth during the 1970s. The show's immense popularity, coupled with Fox's exceptional acting talent, propelled him to financial success in that decade. Despite facing later setbacks, his performance on Sanford and Son stands as a lasting example of how a successful television role can profoundly influence an actor's financial standing. The widespread popularity of Sanford and Son played a pivotal role in propelling Fox to financial prosperity.
prosperity. Airing from 1972 to 1977, the show chronicled the humorous escapades of Fred Sanford, a junk dealer situated in Watts, Los Angeles. Fox's portrayal of the sharp and crafty character resonated with audiences across the nation. The triumph of Sanford and Son not only secured Fox's financial standing, but also opened doors to lucrative contracts, including endorsements, guest appearances on other programs, and even hosting Saturday Night Live. Furthermore, Fox's comedic brilliance illuminated Fred Sanford's character. His impeccable timing, witty one-liners, and physical comedy not only entertained viewers, but also attracted advertisers eager to align their brands with the program's immense popularity. Red Fox's success in Sanford & Son paved the way for lucrative endorsement deals with companies eager to leverage his fame and comedic style. These endorsements not only brought substantial financial rewards, but also further fortified his already substantial net worth. Well, it has changed quite a bit, you know, and uh, with the, uh, like uh, when Dick Gregory came to prominence, a lot of people figured, you know, well, uh, here's a guy that's doing something that's brand new for years, you know, I'd been doing it. In addition to his television success, Fox expanded his influence into film roles during this era, starring in movies like Norman, Is That You?, and Harlem Nights. These cinematic opportunities provided an additional source of income, contributing to his overall wealth. Despite experiencing tremendous financial success, Red Fox encountered challenges that had a negative impact on his net worth. Reports surfaced highlighting his lavish spending habits with claims that he earned millions annually, but spent recklessly. Consequently, these extravagant expenditures gradually eroded his fortune over time. No, I think television threw with me. I've been away from television two or three years, and no one's called me to do anything. I guess they think that I'm just Fred Sanford, and so if they don't have a part for Fred, there's nothing else left, so. Furthermore, multiple divorces took a toll on his finances, as he was required to pay significant sums in divorce settlements. These payouts had a substantial impact on his net worth during that period. In addition to his other financial challenges, Red Fox grappled with significant tax problems that exacerbated his financial struggles. The IRS filed tax liens against him for unpaid income taxes spanning from 1983 to 1986, totaling an astounding $7 million. This amount continued to grow due to penalties and accruing interest, eventually leading to the seizure of his assets and vehicles. Ultimately, a combination of factors, extravagant spending habits, hefty divorce settlements, and unresolved tax issues, coupled with poor financial management, resulted in Red Fox accumulating massive debt and ultimately having a negative net worth upon his death. Despite these challenges in the latter part of his life, Red Fox left an enduring legacy in the entertainment industry through remarkable performances. Notably, in Sanford and Son. His comedic brilliance not only entertained audiences but also played a significant role in building his high net worth during the 1970s. However, some of Red Fox's admirers have consistently held the belief that his financial downfall was influenced by racial factors and systemic issues within the entertainment industry. This perspective suggests that certain power dynamics and biases in the industry played a role in the challenges Fox faced. Interestingly, Cat Williams, a contemporary comedian, appears to share the this belief, as he too has become a target of similar financial struggles. Anticipation filled the air as people geared up for a journey into uncharted comedic realms, courtesy of the renowned actor and comedian Cat Williams at the Mechanics Bank Theater. On December 28, 2023, he took center stage for his enthralling The Dark Matter tour, pledging an evening of humor that pushed boundaries and confronted the established norms. As the tour garnered significant attention, rumors circulated that Williams intended to incorporate even more more controversial content than his October performance. This speculation has sparked concerns that he could potentially draw the scrutiny of influential figures within the entertainment industry. Comedy is very, very dangerous these days. You gotta stay on your pivot feet at all times. Can somebody, anybody move? The conviction in this belief was reinforced by the unfavorable responses that accompanied Cat Williams' previous performances. Particularly noteworthy was his October show, which seemed to elicit strong reactions from both admirers and critics alike. On a Friday evening at the Ocean Center in Daytona Beach, a lineup of comedians took command of the stage, delivering their unique brands of humor, with each set lasting a generous 12 to 15 minutes. Despite the diverse styles of comedy, every performer successfully evoked laughter, ensuring that the audience remained in stitches throughout the night. The humor even extended to playful jests about audience members, including lighthearted banter about white-on-white -white seat disputes. Yeah, I feel you. Brooklyn in the house. Brooklyn don't 
good job for the last two days. They need to do Fear Factor here. Finally, the eagerly awaited moment unfolded as the spotlight illuminated the headliner of the evening, Cat Williams, who confidently took center stage. In the context of his Dark Matter tour, Williams delivered a comedy extravaganza, seamlessly intertwining current events with his distinctive sense of humor. The outcome? An unforgettable evening that left the audience enriched with laughter and adorned with smiles. So that means I have no opinions about Will Smith or Chris Rock. I don't involve myself in nothing the I see. I in the contemporary world, where individuals grapple with the constant pressures of work, familial obligations, and an unending stream of distressing news from television and the internet, the joy of experiencing genuine hearty belly laughs, once a commonplace aspect of life, has become increasingly scarce. Comedian John Ronson emphasizes the significance of connection in this context, stating, that's what this show's about. It's about us and the audience connecting with each other. There's something about being in the same room with somebody, reading each other's body language too. Given these circumstances, it's no surprise that comedy shows are witnessing a surge in demand, not only across the nation, but also globally. In the case of Cat Williams' show, there's an irresistible allure that draws people away from the confines of their homes, promising an opportunity to share laughter and forge connections in a world often overshadowed by the demands of modern life. Keen observers note that people are undeniably hungry, but not for sustenance in the conventional sense. Instead, they crave respite from the perpetual bleakness, seeking a reprieve and a semblance of balance in a world that often seems askew. Looking back at the humor icons of the 80s and 90s, it becomes apparent why these figures occupy a cherished space in our collective memories. Having said that, you walk up here to slap me and you put your hand way up here. <laughs> My job is to not be there when your hand comes down. For enthusiasts of Cat Williams, attending his show transcends a mere night of jokes. It's an immersive experience that connects the absurdities of the world with the collective laughter of a kindred audience. Fearlessly, Williams plunges into the headlines of the day, playfully poking fun at figures ranging from Trump and his mugshot to DeSantis in a yin-yang fashion, and Biden alongside the concept of unclaimed baggage. With an adept touch, he delves into the intricacies of reparations, adds a sprinkle of humor about Ukraine, and playfully explores the enigmatic world of UFOs. This is the dark ages, folks. Look it up in history. Anytime people that tell the truth is attacked, that's called the Dark Age. Cat's fans might not articulate it perfectly, but his show is like listening to a fellow traveler navigating the labyrinth of the bizarre and the bewildering in our world. It's an opportunity for the audience to connect, to momentarily release the weight of the world, and to collectively chuckle at the sheer ridiculousness of it all. One of his fans wrote, I love it when crowd goes quite because he spit that truth. You see the same thing at Chappelle's shows, what makes it even more remarkable, according to his fans, is that throughout the performance, the comedians unabashedly poke fun at the very things that are supposed to divide us. In their own unique way, they bring us closer together, reminding us that laughter is a unifying force, even in the face of what might seem insurmountable differences. Another fan added, this man is always spitting the truth. Remember they tried to blackball him for it, glad to see he ain't let them hold him down. This is where raised eyebrows and speculative connections began to emerge, as people linked various mishaps in Cat Williams' life with his alleged dark revelations about the entertainment industry. Having initiated his career in his teenage years, Williams has honed a comedic style that seamlessly blends articulate and razor-sharp dialogue with a discerning eye for the ever-changing American political landscape. His stand-up prowess has earned critical acclaim, evident in memorable specials such as The Pimp Chronicles, Cat Williams, Pimpadelic, American Hustle, Cat Pacalypse, Cat Williams, Great America, and the latest, Cat Williams World War III on Netflix. In one of his comedy shows, Williams expressed, the past is something for you to learn from, and the future is something that you hope is going to happen. But I'm always speaking to my actual fans in the present tense, and he is totally true. The past is bundled with such examples where the black comedians have never been appreciated. Dave supposedly remarked that once you see their genuine faces, you won't be able to stand them since they are too diabolical to bear. He said, it's the same that these Me Too B was trying to tell you about, but they hate the monster for how it F, and I hate that monster for how it eats. But my God, man, it's the same 
Cat Williams has emerged as a notable whistleblower, fearlessly uncovering hidden truths beneath the glamorous facade of the Hollywood industry. With resolute determination, Cat consistently exposes eye-opening revelations that send shockwaves throughout the entertainment world. And the fact of the matter is, we watched this get murdered right in front of our own face. And the knew it was finna happen, he told us, and we didn't know. Unfazed by the potential discomfort his outspoken approach may cause, Cat Williams fearlessly tackles controversial subjects that appear to have garnered disapproval from certain factions within the industry. Multiple incidents suggest that Hollywood may be deliberately distancing itself from Cat, likely in response to his steadfast and uncompromising stance on these issues. Why? Because you know ain't nobody gonna sleep with him. You only got Tiffany Haddish. She's been doing comedy since she was 16. You often hear that truly understanding the inner workings of an industry requires first-hand experience. Comedian Cat Williams recently provided some intriguing insights that shed light on this notion. Williams hinted at significant revelations concerning many black artists' careers. Um, I think just um, being real as you can be, you know, setting your uh, goals real high. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm just talking about my family right now. I want to just talk about all the stuff I've been going through. Undoubtedly, Cat Williams is widely recognized as one of the funniest comics of his generation, celebrated for his unfiltered humor and dynamic performances in hit stand-up specials. Despite his talent and status among Hollywood's comedy elites, Williams hasn't attained the same level of mainstream exposure as some of his peers. A supporter noted, unlike Kevin Hart, he hasn't embraced leading roles in blockbuster movies, and he doesn't host a show like Steve Harvey. Being hopeless, he once even said, I'm just going to go ahead and announce my retirement from stand-up. I'm kind of done. I've already discussed it with my kids. I wasn't really going to do it on a Seattle street. I was going to Los Angeles and do it in the offices of ICM or Live Nation. For a while, there were rumors suggesting that Williams had been blacklisted from the industry, prompting inquiries into why he hadn't reached the same level of success as figures such as Steve Harvey. It's noteworthy that Williams and Harvey have had a strained relationship for over a decade, and there appears to be a substantial reason behind their ongoing discord. Well, you know, to be honest with you, Frankie, I didn't, I didn't know nothing about this concept. When the promoter told me about it in October, I shot it down. He boldly asserted that he could surpass Steve Harvey and claim the title of the king of comedy during an upcoming New Year's Eve show where both comedians were headlining. Now, I, now, I was on the Steve Harvey show, and Steve Harvey, who was going to call in at 545 and get the f record straight. In response to the clip, Steve Harvey called into the radio show and expressed his bewilderment regarding the entire situation. You know, I've always been on tour with, with, with some real man. I toured yeah. with the Kings. You know, I've been on stage with Sid, DL, and Bernie Mac. On the anticipated night of the event, Cat Williams didn't hold back, launching into a comedic assault that targeted Steve Harvey's reputation in the world of comedy, as well as playfully poking fun at his attire and hairstyle. In addressing the audience, Williams likely sprinkled sharp and humorous remarks about Harvey throughout his performance. He stated, Please give it up for Steve Harvey. He's one of the best we've ever had. But he don't want no parts of this in no shape or form. I don't know why he came out here with all this money y'all spent on these expletive tickets and talked about a lady in the audience for 15 minutes, but won't talk about me the way I'm getting ready to talk about his expletive made expletive. Cat Williams didn't inherit fame and fortune on a silver platter. Instead, he meticulously built his comedic empire from the ground up, starting in Avondale, Cincinnati. He refined his craft by performing stand-up comedy in various venues across the country, from the lively streets of Oklahoma to the vibrant stages of Oakland. Fearlessly, Cat delivered his routines, perfecting his unique style through hard work and dedication. And act like ain't shit happened. You in the middle of a goddamn meeting. Now, yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the movie with you and then we're gonna we're gonna go back. Cat Williams has also made allegations that Steve Harvey, known for his role as a high school music teacher on the 1996 sitcom The Steve Harvey Show, allegedly borrowed the premise of his show from comedian Mark Curry. Curry, who starred as teacher Mark Cooper in the sitcom Hangin' with Mr. Cooper, debuted in 1992. In expressing his perspective, Williams claimed, the same Steve that went to go watch Mark Curry do his whole sitcom and then stole everything Mark Curry had. Now Steve got a sitcom where he's the principal and he wears a suit. Williams didn't shy away from criticizing Harvey's acting abilities, challenging Harvey's assertion that he didn't aspire to pursue a film career. You couldn't be a movie star, Williams asserted. There are 30,000 new scripts in Hollywood 
Hollywood every year. Not one of them asks for a country bumpkin black dude that can't talk good and look like Mr. Potato Head. There ain't none. You have to have range. During an appearance on the Club Shay Shay podcast, the actor-comedian took a critical stance on fellow comics Cedric the Entertainer, Steve Harvey, and Ricky Smiley. During an interview with host Shannon Sharp, Cat Williams aimed to address what he perceived as falsehoods spread about him by low-brow comedians on Sharp's show, characterizing Cedric the Entertainer, Steve Harvey, and Ricky Smiley as a gang. Williams asserted, for 30 years they're a group. These aren't three random guys. All of these dudes are co-entwined, and they share secrets, and this is the age of truth. Williams accused Cedric the Entertainer of appropriating a joke from his comedy set in the late 90s, a joke he also performed on the BET program Comic View. Describing the situation, Williams stated, This is not just a random joke. This is my very best joke, and it's my last joke, and it's my closing joke. In 1998, I'm doing this joke. It's on Comic View. Cedric comes to the comedy store. He watches me in the audience. He comes backstage. He tells me what a great job I did and how much he loves the joke. Two years later, he's doing that as his last joke on the original Kings of Comedy, and he's doing it verbatim. Initially, Williams had given Cedric a pass for using the joke, but his stance changed when Cedric denied taking from Williams' material. Williams remarked, he thought that I was just a no-name comedian and that he could take this joke and nobody would know. In response, Cedric the Entertainer dismissed Williams' allegation as revisionist history in the comment section of an Instagram post featuring a clip from the Club Shay Shay podcast. He emphasized the breadth of his career, including over 40 movies and contributions to other comedians' careers. However, the word is already spread among the public, and recently it was further strengthened when Dave Chappelle got Netflix to remove his show in 2020. In a video, Dave Chappelle revealed the frustration he felt when HBO Max began streaming Chappelle's show through a licensing deal with Viacom CBS. Chappelle explained that he initially signed a contract with Comedy Central when he was a broke, expectant father. I was sure this was it. I knew I was home. I knew I had found my thing. And my God, man, my God, man, I was a child. Despite his departure from the show after signing a $50 million extension with Comedy Central in 2005, he claimed he never got paid for the work. Chappelle expressed disappointment in HBO, recalling how they rejected his pitch years ago and now stream the very show he was pitching to them. They didn't have to pay me because I signed the contract. But is that right? He asked. I found out that these people were streaming my work and they never had to ask me or they never had to tell me. Perfectly legal because I signed the contract. But is that right? As the crowd said it was not, Chappelle added, I didn't didn't think so either. Chappelle criticized the streaming of his work without his consent, highlighting his positive experience with Netflix, which promptly removed Chappelle's show from its platform when he expressed his concerns. Chappelle urged his fans not to watch the show on any platform unless he gets paid for it. While acknowledging the unfavorable contract, he attributed it to the industry rather than race. Chappelle also explained that he can't use the name Chappelle's show if he were to return to sketch comedy due to contractual limitations on his name and likeness. He concluded the video by reaching out to his fans and requesting that they boycott Chappelle's show until he receives compensation. Another comedian was also forced to leave his show. On February 8, 1974, CBS introduced the groundbreaking sitcom Good Times, marking the first ever television show to showcase the complete dynamics of a black family. In this historic moment in American television, John Amos delivered a pioneering portrayal of James Evans, the respected patriarch of the iconic Evans clan. For many viewers, Good Times provided the initial and perhaps sole insight into the dynamics of an African-American household. We had a lot of uh, contention about that uh, because I, I felt like I knew more about what a black family should be and how a black father mm. would act than our writers none of whom were, were black. However, to the disappointment of the show's supporters, James Evans met an untimely demise during the height of Good Times popularity. Speculation arose about the reasons behind this decision, with rumors suggesting contractual disagreements between the producers and John Amos. In a comprehensive interview with the Archive of American Television in May 2015, Amos clarified the circumstances surrounding his departure from the show. Explaining his early exit, Amos revealed, my early departure from the show I felt that with two younger children, one of whom aspired to become a Supreme Court Justice, Ralph Carter, Michael Evans, and the other, Byrne Nadette Stannis, Thelma Evans, who aspired to become a surgeon, the differences I had with the producers of the show were due to what I perceived as too much emphasis being placed on JJ and his chicken hat, saying, dynamite, every third page. 
I believe that just as much emphasis and entertainment could have been derived from exploring the stories of my other two children and the humor that could have naturally unfolded from their experiences. Stating creative differences with the show's writers and producers, Amos said of his 1976 departure, I left because I was told that my services were no longer needed because I had become a disruptive element. In other words, I didn't have the diplomacy that I think I've cultivated over the last 10 or 15 years. Being born in Newark, raised in East Orange, I had a way of voicing my differences against the script that weren't acceptable to the creative staff. I mean, the writers got tired of having their lives threatened over jokes. You see how they just abruptly order the comedians to leave the show. Moreover, throughout the years, several black comedians have opted to don dresses in their quest for humor. The contrast of a commanding figure in high heels generates an inherently absurd and consequently amusing visual. Yet the ramifications extend beyond surface-level amusement. Many people also believe that this is the only way for the comedians to remain part of their art. This pattern has witnessed many black male comedians embracing cross-dressing as a comedic device. What are the repercussions of this form of comedy grounded in cross-dressing. In the words of Dave Chappelle, When I see that they put every black man in the movies in a dress at some point in their career, I'll be connecting them down like, why all these brothers gotta wear a dress? In a recent interview on Oprah's show, comedian Dave Chappelle posed a compelling question. He reflected on the recurring phenomenon of successful black male entertainers turning to cross-dressing at certain points in their careers. A notable example is Martin Lawrence, who gained acclaim for his lead role in the Big Mama's House series. Similarly, Eddie Murphy incorporated a female character into the diverse roles he portrayed in his Nutty Professor film series. This happened to me. I'm doing a movie with Martin. Yeah. The movie's going good. So I walk in a trailer. I'm like, man, this must be the wrong trailer because there's a dress in here. Jamie Foxx left his mark with the unforgettable Ugly Wanda persona on In Living Color, whereas Marlon and Sean Wyans embraced gender reversal for their roles in White Chicks. Additionally, the ill-fated Juana Man movie from a few years back remains a chapter we may wish to put behind us. I'm here! Ooh, that girl getting around. Me, right? Amongst these instances, one figure stands out as the most prominent cross-dresser of our time, Tyler Perry. Known not only for his entertainment ventures, but also for his right-wing evangelical influence, Perry's Medea franchise has achieved considerable success and recognition. What the hell is Black Friday? Every Friday, I'm, it's Friday, I'm black, that's a Black Friday. What are you talking about? <laughs> In the historical context, it seems like black artists have consistently faced violations, a trend that seems to have originated from the early days of their artistic endeavors. The persistent infringement on their rights and dignity reflects a deeply rooted issue. That's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.